Welcome to Dominion Today with Dr. Mark and Blanca Garcia. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Dominion Today. I'm so excited to be with you. Look at our new set. We are progressing forward. We are doing, uh, we're trying to do everything possible to make things new, make things a little bit more uh, entertaining uh, to you guys, uh, but also still not compromise and bring the message of God to you um, and what God has given us for you guys. All right. So I want to start, as we always do with Dominion Today, with some questions. You know, have you ever found yourself believing for something and it did not happen the way you were believing for it? Have you ever believed for something, received it, and yet it did not turn out how you thought it would actually turn out? The fact is that you are probably not alone. We all have. We all have in our walk one time or another launched out in faith in something and it would appear that we were disappointed. Yet we all know that this disappointment usually leaves a mark in our lives. That mark causes us to get a place, get to a place of doubt or even insecurity or some deep tenacity. And right after this, we're going to continue and I'm going to share some word with you. So high school was supposed to be fun, right? Uh, what I personally didn't anticipate was any type of rejection and maybe right now things are not turning out the way that you expected. At the age of 17, I found myself in love for the first time. When it's toxic, it's good and then it's toxic, that, that's called dating violence. I found out that I was pregnant, I was homeless and from chaos that faint plus sign turned into a sign of hope for me. Maybe Unplanned is a book I wrote really for the 17-year-old me. Remember that life is not over. It's only going to be different than you imagined it. Hey guys, welcome back. <clears throat> so the ultimate question we are left, oftentimes when we find a place in a, in a place of doubt or insecurity, even tenacity, is now what? What do we do? What do we do with the emotion that we still have based from the promise that we believe God has given us? In a wonderful story in the Old Testament, there is a true story about a woman, her husband, and a prophet by the name of Elisha. And it's found in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. I'm going to read from there. When Elisha arrived, the child was indeed dead. Lying there in the prophet's bed, he went in alone and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. Then he lay down on the child's body, placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, and his hands on the child's hands. And as he stretched out on him, the child, the child's body began to grow warm again. Elisha got up, walked back and forth across the room once, and then stretched himself out again on the child. This time the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Verse 36. Then Elisha summoned Gehazi. Call the child's mother, he said. And when she came in, Elisha said, Here, take your son. She fell at his feet and bowed before him, overwhelmed with gratitude. Then she took her son in her arms and carried him downstairs. So, now the background to the story. This woman was declared unable to have a child. She was actually, if you read into history, you figure out that she is actually a rich woman. She is very well off, her and her family very well off. But yet, she finds herself being declared unable to have a child. And so her deep down desire, her, her, her desire to serve was so great that her level of social influence was so great that she and her husband built an apartment for the man of God, for the prophet to stay at. The second thing is, the second behind the scene thing or the background, is the prophet wants to give her something. He stays in that place for some time and has a conversation with his servant Gehazi, says that, what can we give this woman? Now, the interesting part is that it wasn't monetary. It was nothing materialistic. Why? Because she had all that stuff. And then the prophet releases a word to her. He says, this time or this season next year, you will hold a child in your arms. Now, we see in this woman something we can see all, all too often in ourselves, doubt. She says to him, I don't know. Don't lie to me. Don't give me false hopes. You see, it doesn't matter how long you try, the challenge, the desert, desert experience will pass. This will also pass. 
And so she has this child, but something happens while this young man is helping his dad. He essentially has an aneurysm and dies in her lap. And then after that is where we found that we just read concerning this. So here's the key, the key point. What do you do when your dream has died in your lap? What do you do when you find yourself holding the promise given to you, but the promise appears to be dead? Can you imagine the agony that she must have felt? My guess, yes, because I believe there are people watching who know exactly what I'm talking about. Know exactly the anguish that this woman was going through in her life. Know exactly the loss that she was having in her life because maybe they even had it personally. So as a result, she, with the tenacity, goes and decides to go after the man who told her that she will have a child. She goes and finds him, and Elisha sends his servant first, and he tries everything but nothing, no results. But this woman's tenacity was to the promise, to the point that she said, I'm not leaving without you. He leaves with her and goes into the room where he had stayed before, prays over him, and life returns back to him. And I'm here to tell you today, no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, what you think was taken from you, all of this too shall pass if you don't give up. All of this, all the situations, all the challenges that you have in your life, all the, the situations that have presented themselves in your life, this too shall pass. Situations, circumstances, financial challenges, divorce, child, children leaving, any and all situations, this too shall pass. Now, I'm not making light of all these situations. They are very real, but they will come to an end. And on the other side of that, if you hold fast to what you promise, I can guarantee you that it will be glorious. There are only two people on the face of the earth that can say it is done. That's you and God. However, the simple fact is that we know God will never say it because he said it with Jesus. But if you do it, and if you say it's done, I'm done, then he'll just agree with you. I believe God wants to birth a miracle inside of you. God has already planted a dream inside of you. No matter your age, where you're at financially, there is a dream deposited inside of you that propels you to move on. There's something inside you that says there has to be something greater. There is something greater. And sometimes God's allow, God allows that dream to die. That may sound counterproductive, but the scripture says, unless the seed falls into the ground and dies, unless it dies, it won't be able to give fruit. Now, in that reference, we look in the context, it's actually talking about dying to ourself, our flesh. But experience of dream dying uh, is, is not something easy to understand or comprehend. You know, my wife and I, we shared in this program many times before, we've actually come to the place to where we've actually understood that the dream is dead, but it's not really dead. And so we, when we started ministry in North Carolina, excuse me, we did everything that we could. For seven years, we poured our mind, our heart, our blood, sweat, and tears, and everything in. Um, we, it seemed like everything was going great. We got a place, we got a facility, um, a, a company donated the carpeting to, to us, and we carpeted the place, and, and we set up the sound booth and everything else. My son and I, I remember doing, doing all of that. And so we started and we did ministry as best as we knew how with the, situ with, the, with the things that we had, the tools that we had at that moment. And then we realized that after six, five, six years, we realized that it just wasn't working. People would come and they wouldn't stay with us. People would, would tell us they liked the vision, they liked what we're sharing and what we're reaching, but they would not tie in, they'd not make a, a, a root relationship with us and get in with us to do what God has called us to do in North Carolina, what we felt. And so we found ourselves evaluating ourselves to figure out what is going on. Essentially, we moved from New York to North Carolina for specifically starting ministry. And so we're seeing that ministry is, 
It's just, it looks like the dream is dead. We went with the full expectation, with the full excitement and, and the expectation of we are doing what God has called us to do. We went with a, with a uh, Abraham and, and Sarah mentality. We're going to do this. We're going to launch forward and do what God has called us to do. We're excited about it until five, six years down the line, we, we realized that this is, not, this is not working. Something is up. The dream that we had when we left New York was slowly dying, if not dead, at that point. But here's the gist. Just because it doesn't work the first time, doesn't mean it's time to quit and throw in the towel forever. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 32, when a dream has seemed to have died, or something does not seem to be working, the best thing to do is shut the door and get a fresh word from God for you. Shut out the words of failure. When nothing is impossible, anything can happen. When nothing is impossible, anything can happen. What is the dream in your heart? Do past failures stir up fear in declaring it? When the miracle comes to your life, you have to tell somebody. You have to talk to somebody and tell them, this is what God is doing in my life. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses tw- verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. There's three key words in there. And I'm gonna, if I get, I'm going to get a little technical here. I'm going to get a little uh, theological and, 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 and get into the depth of the word. And I hope you follow along with me. And if not, I apologize. But this has to be shared with you because the principle that I'm about to continue to share with you hinges on this very thing. All right. So it's, there's three words, a key focus on Hebrews 10, 23. The first one is hold fast. And that's the Greek word kat echo. It comes from the root kata, which is something coming from downward, something subjugating, subjugating. It's, uh, it's, it echoes to embrace something, all right? So the conjunction, the echo, that word echo, is to embrace something. So the conjunction of that word in the Greek lets us know that we need to wrap our arms around this thing and hold on to it and not let it conquer you, but you conquer it. It is that holding fast. It is that maintaining the tenacity to progress forward that we all need to walk in and understand that this is what God has called us to. So don't, do, don't lo- let loose what you know God has given you. You have to make a choice and decide this is mine and I am not moving. This is what holding fast is all about. This is what Hebrews 10, 23, when it says, hold fast the confession, the profession of your faith, because faithful is he who promised it. So essentially it's saying, I'm not moving. I don't care what life does. I don't care what people say. I'm not going to let go of what God said to me. And so now we look at the second word, the word profession or the confession. And that's the Greek word homologian. The homo is one of the same kind. And logian is the logos, which is a written word. And compounded, it says, To say the same thing, alignment, in agreement, it's an agreement term. Not just repeating like a parrot, but fully agreeing wholeheartedly. If it is not from the heart, it is not a confession. I'm going to say that again because it's important. If it is not from the heart where Jesus resides, then it is not a confession. It is just words spewing out of your mouth. All right? Homologian. Kateko, hold fast, because you have that thing in your heart that you know is given by God in your heart. Releasing that word, coming into agreement with what God has said about you. Homologian, what God has said in his word about you and what, and, and what you have discovered in the word concerning you. I love the phrase that I heard a long time ago where a preacher could encourage us, you need to find yourself in Scripture. Find yourself in Scripture. Yeah, you're not going to find your, your full name in there unless you have a biblical name like myself, Mark. All right, I can go to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, but you, you will probably won't find your name particularly in there. All right, you won't find the name Juan in there. You won't find, the, you, know, you know, the name Paula. Uh, you find Paul, but you won't find Paula. You know, you won't find those names in there. But you need to find your, your, the, the situation that you're in, the circumstance that you're in, and find out what you need to confess, 
what you need to agree with wholeheartedly, that homologium. Get in agreement with that word and release it out of your mouth as a confession. Not just words spewing out of your mouth, but something that is birthed from inside you. You know, one of the things that we always shared uh, and we, and we kind of share with everybody that we talk to about scripture is that, you know, we know in your heart of hearts, you know when you know that what you're saying is from conviction and when it's not. You do. And so let's hold fast the confession. Hold fast the homologian. Hold fast that word that God has given you from his word, that prophetic word that God has declared over you. Now, the third word is the word wavering. Wavering. So we looked over profession. We, we, I'm sorry, we looked, up, looked over hold fast, conf, profession or confession. And now we're going to look at wavering. The word wavering gives a actually a connotation of a person who becomes so weak he can no longer stand. Who becomes so enamored by failure that there's no reason for him or her to continue forward. They've thrown in the towel. They've let go and they found themselves so weak and they can't go on any further. So in summary, what it's actually saying in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23 is, Embrace that word from God, which he has told you. Once he told you, nothing can stop you from accomplishing that which he told you. If God has given you a word for your life and you let go of that word, if you allow someone to steal that word from you, it will not be long that you will begin to lose the energy that you once had in your life. You will wobble and get tired and soon sit down and then lay down and go to bed in your faith on the word which God has given you. When we were in North Carolina, that's exactly what began to happen. In fact, when we came to South Carolina, now, right now where we find ourselves, we actually did the same thing all over again because we, we found out, we, we understood that by God, what God has told us that we're not called to be local pastors. And so we focused entirely on television and we let go of ministry entirely. And so we swung the pendulum so far because we got weary, we got tired, we got weak in doing ministry. And we swung the pendulum so far we focused totally on TV. And now God is telling us, no, you need to readjust that pendulum some. You need to bring that pendulum back into center and find balance because it was never one or the other. It was both and. And so we find ourselves in that same place right now. And I'm, tell I'm talking to you right now, this day. It is time. It is time for us to stand up, hold fast what God has told us to do. When God speaks a word into your life, you better hold on to it because your life will depend on that word. Your life will be hinging on that word. We're going to take a pause right here and we'll be right back with the finality of this thing that I like to call, This Too Shall Pass. So high school was supposed to be fun, right? Uh, what I personally didn't anticipate was any type of rejection and maybe right now things are not turning out the way that you expected. At the age of 17, I found myself in love for the first time. When it's toxic, it's good, and then it's toxic, that's called dating violence. I found out that I was pregnant. I was homeless, and from chaos, that faint plus sign turned into a sign of hope for me. Maybe Unplanned is a book I wrote really for the 17-year-old me. Remember that life is not over. It's only going to be different than you imagined it.
Hey guys, welcome back. We're going to bring this thing to a finality. I want you guys to look at Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to go from verse 1 to 3, and then we're going to delve even into that. I hope we have enough time here. So Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. You know, Hebrews 11 is called the, 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 uh, the chapter of the Hall of Faith. And it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now let's delve into that. The word substance there in verse 1 is hupostasis. Hupo comes alongside something, and stasis means to stand, which means to stand alongside something. Now faith is the thing that you stand alongside of. Hmm. Wow. Faith is a thing that you stand alongside of with things that are hoped for. This gives us a picture of a bulldog who found the bone of his dreams. Faith is therefore an attitude. Faith says, I am not going to forget or lose grip of what God told me in my assignment, but hold on tightly and walk toward the goal. And the second part, for by it, in verse 2, faith that unrelenting, never give up, unyielding faith, the elders obtained a good report. Now the elders speak of the Old Testament patriarchs, the ones who heard from God and said, no, I will not let go and use this bulldog type of faith to obtain the promises. And then it goes on to the list, all of those many people, the patriarchs that we know of in Hebrews 4 and on, okay? So here's the challenge though with that. In verse 3, It seems to be talking about creation, but it's not. It's saying through faith, this unrelenting never give up, we understand, uh, unrelenting never give up faith. We understand that the worlds were framed. It's not speaking of creation, and if it was, it would use the Greek word cosmos, or geis, which is earth. The word world there is aion which means a specific periods of time in the history of man, a decade, a concrete beginning, a concrete ending, a generation. I hope you guys are getting this. A generation. Now the word framed is not the word for creation, but to take something already existing and refashion it or reshape it. Just as an example, a clay. Clay is shaped into a vase. And then that clay can, that same clay, that same material can be shaped into a statue. Same clay, different form. And then it says, by the word of God, is mistranslated there, as it really reads a word from God, a spoken word from the Lord to that person. And so let's look at it again. Now faith is a substance, that thing that we stand next to alongside of when we think of things of hope, for evidence of things not seen, for it, for by it, faith, the elders, the patriarchs, right, obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the worlds, or not the globe or the earth, but the generations were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. The thing that was, by faith, we understand that the generations were formed and fashioned by the word of God. In other words, the generation was there, but it was fashioned. It was made into something by the word of God. And so I want to share with you, it doesn't matter the situation that you're in. It doesn't matter the challenges that you're in. It doesn't matter matter divorce, uh, separation from family, uh, an accident, car accident, a health issue. Those things are real. I'm not denying that. But if you have a word from God, hold fast to that word from God. See, because here's the gist of it all. And I'm going to surmise all of this in one simple phrase. God has given a word to you for your generation. God has begun to form your generation by you. It starts with you. That in Hebrews, it goes to list all of those men and women of God who by faith obtained a good testimony. And now it's up to us to understand that our generation, 
are being formed and fashioned by the Word of God, the Word of God that's put inside of us, that dream, that aspiration that God has put inside of us from the, from the foundations of the world. You see, that dream and that aspiration didn't come to you in the evening hour. It may have been revealed in dreams or what have you, or even prophetic words from, from men and women of God led by the Holy Spirit. But that dream, that aspiration that God has put inside you was put inside you from the beginning of time. God set something inside of you. And he said, now is the time for you to come onto this earth because the assignment that I have for you comes right into play into this big old chess game, if you will. Not really a chess game, but so you can understand. Okay? And so he has imparted this thing into you so that you can touch your generation, impact your generation, and make a change in your generation based on the word and the dream, the aspiration, the goal that he has. You know, we often tie into this phrase of saying, well, God has a plan for me. God has a plan for your life. And that is true, partially. I don't believe God has a specific plan for you. God has a plan overall and it's our, our responsibility to figure out our part in His plan. What is it that God has destined me to do? What is it that God has purposed for me to do? What is the talents, the giftings that He has given me in my life that I can, can impact a generation and form it to the Word of God, to make the Word of God not null and void, but to make the Word, word of God something fruitful, not only in my life, but in the life of others around me. This is the impacting generation. You are called to have a word from the Lord for your generation. God has given it to you and it's wrapped up in that dream. It's wrapped up in that aspiration. It's wrapped up in that purpose and destiny that he has given you from before the foundations of the world. It is time for you, my dear brother and sister, to now discover it, walk it out, and find yourself in scripture and see God manifest himself through you to your generation. I am Dr. Mark Garcia. This is Dominion Today, and I'm, again, excited to be with you. It has been awesome. I hope this has been a blessing to your life. If it has, please let us know, and uh, shoot us an email or give us a call. That would be great. Encourage us as we could press forward in doing this very thing that we believe God has called us to do to impact your lives. And thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to come into your home and minister and bring you the Word of God at this time and this moment for your life. Until next time, this is Dr. Mark Garcia, Dominion Today. God has designed you for Dominion Today. You're blessed. Dominion Today is an outreach ministry of The Bridge Ministries. If this program has been an encouragement to you, Dr. Mark and Blanca would love to hear from you. Visit our website, bethebridgesc.org, or call 864-469-0837. Remember, God created you for Dominion Today.